And now for your listening pleasure, here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Well, hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose, and welcome to episode number 385 of This Old Marketing for Friday, July 21st, 2023. And with me, as always, as he always is, my colleague and a guy, well, his career is only just shy of being as hot as it is in Florida right now, Mr. Joe Polizzi, on the road. Uh, I, I, I am on the road, so it looks yeah. a little different. Yeah, I, you've it. got you've got a nautical theme working for you there in the background. It's yeah, like I got nautical, I got golf, I got all all sorts of stuff. I'm at. Yeah, it's like you're in a. It's like it's pirate golf is what it is. Is really what you've got going on there. It's, yeah, it depends on yeah how you look at it. But yeah, we're I'm in I'm in North Carolina right now, and it is going to get up to I think 96 degrees today. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's like it is here in Southern California, degrees. but it's well, humid there. I got, well, I got almost, imagine. almost the same as your your favorite band of all time, ninety eight degrees. Uh, I know you have their wait. Well. Whoa, that remember that when the Backstreet just, Boys? I remember uh, when the Backstreet Boys came out, but you were like, uh, uh-uh, uh, I'm not one of the boys. I, I'm ninety eight <laughs> degrees, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could name a 98 degree song. I don't think I don't. Well, okay. Well, Isn't that the one with, wait a minute, hold on. I always get confused. 98 degrees. That was the one with the, uh, what's her name's husband, right? What, the, um, what kind of a reference? Is, yes. It's uh, the one with what's her name's husband. You know, the guy, the, the, um, I give, anyway. Yeah. It doesn't I mean, matter. Nobody. Backstreet can. boys was the Wahlberg kid and, the, yes, the Wahlberg, Mark Wahlberg's brother was in that one, and then In Sync was Justin Timberlake. In Sync, Justin Timberlake, right? See, I know nothing about these boy bands. I, I really don't. I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, well, obviously, I mean, the Wahlbergs made good, so I mean, they they obviously. Oh did my it, goodness gracious! Yeah, that whole thing, and I mean, he was he was Funky <clears throat> Bunch. It had you had Mark, yeah. Mark and the Funky Bunch at the same time. You had Backstreet Boys, sort of. He found his groove. Um, in uh, I, I uh, one of my favorite shows is Blue Bloods. I I love that show. Um, and he's that's great. The other in Wahlberg. The, I What's know it's name? the other Wahlberg. I, I, I don't know who which, which one we're talking about, but yeah, that's the other one. He's the so you get the one Wahlberg who's the actor. He's in Blue Bloods, and then you get the other Wahlberger Berg who did the Wahlberger right the the, yes. the, the burger well, joint. What's interesting is so you have Mark Wahlberg sort of trying to be Ryan Reynolds, but it's sort of the B version. Oh, yeah. So you have Ryan Reynolds yeah. with, you know, it's got the oh, uh, soccer team yeah. in Wrexham. He's got Aviation Gin. He just sold for a billion to T-Mobile with, with Mint Mobile. And then That's you right. have Mark Wahlberg, who does Wahlburgers with the with his brothers and mom and the whole family, but then has Mark Wahlberg Chevrolet. So it's just, <laughs> it's just, a, it, and he's saying hello to your mother he's, for me. <laughs> he's got, he, he has car dealerships all yeah. over the country, but it's just not Aviation Gin, Wrexham. No. No, it's, it's a different a level. A little bit, yeah. It's, it's just like, a little bit. Nah. Well, I mean, I'm sure he's doing very well for himself. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sure. You know, no, yeah. yeah. He he's not. I think I think <clears throat> that that Mark Wahlberg is probably worth a hundred million, while Ryan Reynolds is probably worth a billion. So he's ten percent <laughs> Ryan Reynolds, which is which is not bad. I would want to be one percent. If I was one percent Ryan Reynolds, my wife would love me so much more. There it is. That's that's the that's see there that you've now nailed it. Yes, I want to be one percent. One percent. Even even yeah. I mean, I don't need that money. It's just like if you own a Bitcoin, you know, I feel really good about that. But it's like one one hundredth of a one hundredth of the total supply. I'm okay sure. with that. The yeah. same thing would be true if I was one one hundredth of a percent of the Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Which that's not to change to- topics, but I, you know how I, I do it this. Yeah. Uh, I, in two days from now, you know, we're recording this at a very special time. Uh, I will, I'm supposed to see uh, Ryan Reynolds might be in. Uh, oh, right. Chapel you're going Hill. to the game. Yeah. I know you're going, going to the, the game. Yeah. yeah. We're going to the Chelsea Wrexham friendly. I don't know if it's called a friendly exhibition match. Right. And it's a little we, Savannah banana like is what it is. It, it probably Kinda. is sort of. But we don't. Nobody knows if Ryan's going to be there. Well, see, 
that's the <laughs> I mean that's marketing. That is marketing how, right there. That's what it is. It's called creating scarcity. How close do you remember the movie Cocoon? When did you touch <laughs> oh my God. we are you, we are no, so nineties today. That is so no, funny. I got a point. Okay, I got a yes. point with this whole thing. Yeah. Remember in Cocoon when the, Yes, when, I do. When the big cocoon eggs were in the pool. <laughs> you know, and Wilfred Brimley That's right. was watching over them and said, yep. Hey, you know, you can you can swim in the pool, Steve Gutenberg, but don't touch him. You remember? And then they all started to get, you know, feel young again. Sure. Yeah. Stuff. If I get close enough to Ryan Reynolds, will so, will some of that rub off on me? That's that's the question. Like a is, cocoon is, egg. Is, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is a cocoon egg. Yeah. Okay. E- yeah. Everything this everything this man touches turns to gold. That's true. So that is that is true. So I'm under the assumption that it works the other way. If everything he touches turns to gold, what if you touch him? That I think. <laughs> yeah. I I think that's a I think that's a sound theory, and I'd like to see I'd like picks or it didn't happen. As first of all, I need to see you put your hand on Ryan Reynolds. That's gonna be right. and get a selfie. Um, and then the second thing is, of course, uh, that is a prompt that I would love to see put into Dolly, which is Ryan Reynolds as a cocoon egg. <laughs> that might uh, yeah that that could actually work. Yeah, uh, maybe that maybe that'll be the image for this episode. But it anyways, we're looking forward be. to. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've never, I've, I've never been to a, I've been to a football match in, in England, but I've never been to one in the United States. So this that's going to be, be great. It's, yeah. it's you're going to have the best time. I mean, it's going to be hotter than blazes, yeah. but it's going to yeah. be 117 degrees with the humidity. Yeah, and uh, we're all going to be melting, but it should be a, a, a lot of fun. And, yeah, it's uh, kind of crazy been, how it is. I've never been to, to Chapel Hill either. I've never been to. to oh, Chapel Atlanta. Hill's lovely. Yeah, I have family there, um, and it's uh, in that in that whole area. Um, and uh, it's you have it's, family everywhere. How many states? No, I don't. Do you have I have. I have. I well, let's see. One, uh, one two. <laughs> Rhetorical three. question. I have three. I have three. No, you ask. They answer. I know. Um, basically, Texas, yeah. No, it's California, North Carolina, North Carolina, Carolina. and Florida. And Texas, yeah, but you don't like Florida. I, I really don't. <laughs> I, I really, really don't. I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, my Floridian pals, but yeah, it's no Florida is, yeah, it's it, it, Florida, and I have for anybody who's followed me on social media when I used to have to travel a lot more for business. I used to have this running gag, uh, the the competition between me and Florida. Whether whenever I would travel to Florida, whether Florida would get me or I would get Florida. Um, and it was pretty even there for a long time where I would go and just have the most miserable time or I would go and actually have an okay time and get out. Now, there's some lovely parts of Florida that I that I can actually stand being in, uh, mostly on the Gulf side, I would say. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm not a I'm, I'm not a fan generally of the state. We were talking about because we we drove from Ohio and we made a stop in Richmond and then spent a couple of days in Duck which is beautiful area. I've got, I've got a, a, some friends there. And we were talking about how far south do you go until it's south? And it's a really oh. interesting question well, because... I mean, there's a, there's, like there's, there is an Midwest, answer to that. Like, yeah, I mean, we, we talked about... So somebody asked me, like, what is is, uh, Phil, is Pittsburgh Midwest or East? I said, absolutely Midwest. Is Philadelphia? Is Philadelphia's East. So somewhere along in Pennsylvania, you move from East mentality to Midwest mentality. If you will, well, South, South <laughs> yeah, is the that, same thing. South, you've heard you've heard the joke, right? You've heard, you you've definitely heard the joke. It's I don't know what what's the joke. The jo- well, the joke is basically <laughs> you have if Pennsylvania is Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in between. That's that's the joke. Is that the joke? That's Mm-mm. the joke. I don't, now I'm not a. Pennsylvania resident, so I can't vouch for that joke. I have I have been to some of the mid, let's call them the mid parts of Pennsylvania, and yeah, I mean I yeah, can see can, I can see it. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's interesting. Well, I I went to to Penn State, which yeah, so did my wife. Yeah, middle. so did my like, wife. You yeah. can sit yeah. you can sit on a sundial at the in front of the administration building at Penn State University, and it is the exact middle. Up north, south, east, and west of Pennsylvania. 
Which I did not know that. That's about. that is that is today I learned. Today I learned you could do that. Yeah, I have been to Happy Valley. It's 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 a beautiful place. It's absolutely spectacular, beautiful place. Because I've been there with my wife for for one of her reunions, um, and uh, I mean it's beautiful there. But you it know, is. I mean I've also driven through some of the hinterlands, let's call it, of Pennsylvania, and and went okay. This is this reminds me of when I used to drive through Arkansas or yeah. Alabama. So the the point the point is back <laughs> yeah, to the point and there the is point, one <laughs> and we do have a point this is, we're coming back around to Florida here <laughs> when you leave Cleveland and let's say you get just and you're you're going south east you're sort of south I mean you feel that like even even before you get into West Virginia or you get into Virginia you sort of feel south but when you hit Florida you're not south anymore you're Florida. You know well, that's saying? true. Yeah, like no, no, no. Florida, that's absolutely. Somebody said, like, yeah. are you, if, you're, if you're in Atlanta, are you south? Like, are you feel? Yeah, absolutely. You've yeah. got you've got everything southern. You got the southern feel, everything. But once you get into Florida, Florida's not south. Yeah, Florida's Florida, and I don't know what that means. And we have a lot of friends and people that listen to this show that are in Florida, but people that are in Florida know it. Hundred <laughs> percent. What's this? By the way, it's the same with Texas, right? You know, there's the south, and then there's Texas. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's the same there, too. I mean, you know, I mean, I would say the having grown up in that part of the world that the panhandle of Florida is pretty southern. Right. So you get into Gainesville and, you know, get into there and it's and it's the south. It's definitely the South, but you get down, you start getting into the Northern parts of Florida and then Orlando and all of that. Yeah. It's definitely Florida. I mean, you did, there's definitely, a, there's a specific, it's a specific sort of umami taste in the mouth that the Florida sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, we probably, do we have a show yeah. today? Maybe we, we do have a show today. We do have a show today, despite the fact that you're on the road here. Um, and we are going to the show uh, talk. goes on no matter the show, where we're at. Des is absolutely true. Um, okay. So yeah, we're going to talk about a few things and most of it around social media, because that's where the big news is, uh, over the last couple of weeks. So, uh, Elon has come out this week, uh, kind of breaking news really, but, but, uh, but certainly not surprising news. Elon says Twitter's ad revenue is down by 50% and cash flow is negative, uh, as, uh, threads maybe continues to drink its milkshake, but we don't know because we're also going to ask the question is threads already spiraling, um, some news outlets already showing that the engagement on the very new social media platform is off by a lot. Um, and I can feel it a little bit. You know, the heat has really sort of come off a little bit. But then um, we'll also talk about the media industry, broadly speaking, and how it's in terminal turmoil and, and may not change any time soon. Um, very interesting things going on all over the media industry, and it's worth sort of a discussion about what all those things are and where we might see the future of media over the next year and a half. And then we've got two questions uh, this week. We've got the question that we didn't get time to get to last week, which of course from our friend Peter, um, and then uh, which is an audio question. And then we'll ask another question about uh, a midlife marketing crisis, which may be a fun discussion as well. Then of course we'll get to our rants and race sections where Joe will talk a little bit about AI, a discussion about AI that uh, happened with Professor Galloway uh, this week and uh, give a review of that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the actor and writer strike, more specifically about the actors and the writers, um, because I know a little more about it. But um, just talk a little bit about how perhaps the studios aren't the Bond villain that they're being made out to be. So hopefully that will tee things up a little bit. Of course not. Um, They only, all these big companies only have the best of intentions for their employees. That's right. Yes. Well, that that may not be true either, but we need to be able to hold at least (laughs) some, you know, two conflicting ideas in our heads at the same time. And that's the only, that's going to be my only point is that, you know, it's not, it's not black and white. There is a lot of gray here that we need to be thinking about. And, and also the fact that, the, you know, this is absolutely one of those cases, both the actors and the writers, you should be careful what you're asking for because you just might get it. Um, Ooh, and I can't wait to you know, hear your, yeah. your commentary on that one. Yeah. Of course, you're, you, this is insider information. I don't know if it's insider information, but it's certainly close to the it's 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 close to home, right? So I I, I know a little. I know I've been looking at it and studying it and reading a lot about it. So. You know, we we didn't talk about this before you get to the news, but it is newsworthy. 
and it affects you and I because you and I are both published by McGraw Hill. But ah, uh, yes, uh, could, yeah, it's 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 public information. Although I haven't seen a news release about it, but McGraw Hill Education, which publishes Killing Marketing, which publishes my book Content Inc., Epic Content Marketing, uh, they have decided not to. Uh, purchase any new business books. Yeah. So the business book, they so they'll keep all the time. So basically, if we take Killing Marketing for example, that book will stay a McGraw Hill Education book, but McGraw Hill Education will not go and purchase en- the rights to any new books, which is interesting. I don't know you. You and I had a little bit of back and forth on it. Do you have a? A take that this surprise you that it's, it's, it's decision? It, it surprises me um, because as I understand it, uh, the market for business books is doing okay. Um, younger professionals are definitely reading books and, and buying books. As I understand it, I'm now I am no expert in this field for sure. I wonder if this is a wrap it up in a bow and try and sell off this part of the division for McGraw Hill. I wonder if this is a, I, I, you know, my, hmm. my question, and I don't have a good answer for it. Certainly just having learned of it yesterday is whether this is McGraw Hill problem or challenge or opportunity, or whether this is a broader thing that we're going to start to see in the business publishing marketplace. I mean, we all know that books are tough. It's a tough, tough business these days uh, and has been democratized in so many ways by custom publishing um, through, you know, things like uh, Amazon, et cetera. But we'll, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely an important milestone for sure. I think there's, what's great about what's going on with business books specifically is, is that there's so many amazing people and thought leaders developing books because they can, they've got yeah. a, a small devoted loyal audience. They can go out uh, and publish their own books, either do it themselves. They can publish through a company like Lulu, yep. and it works amazingly well. And so you have hundreds and hundreds of those. You and I, I mean, when you, when you, let's say, go back to 2017 when Killing Marketing was published, we were still, I think, uh, one of the fewer of our friends that had a, a book published by, let's say, a McGraw Hill or a Wiley. Most people hadn't gotten there or they had they did a, their own self-published thing or it wasn't great, but they did it. Well, now the technology is there and everyone can ha- has their own audience and can sell direct today that creating a book is open to everyone. That's right. Which is which is wonderful and terrible for the bi- traditional business model of a book. Yeah, and- well, it's the distribution, right? I mean, th- you know, the reason that you <clears throat> chose to a publisher over self-publishing was, I mean, the calculus was very easy as an author. If you, you know, money was never going to be a question either way, right? So self-publishing or going through a publisher, you're, you know, unless you're writing novels or, you know, basically yeah. B2C titles where you can expect to either get licensed for a movie or, or get very, very, you know, high levels of, of uh, consumption, business books just don't sell that many books. And so, you know, even if the, even the huge hits don't sell big, big, big numbers, and so the 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 money it wasn't it was the revenue was always sort of around. Okay, well, if you want a lot of distribution and you want to make that easier on yourself, you go with a, a publisher because they can get into the libraries, they can get into the colleges, they can get into uh, bookstores, they can get into the airports, they can get into the places where you want your book to sit physically. Um, and then also have the relationships theoretically with some of the digital uh, commerce stores. But if you if you were really trying to optimize profitability and you and to your point had a small audience and you're just wanting to have a book as a calling card, custom publishing is a perfect you know a perfect way to do that because you manage all of the marketing, you manage all of the the publish uh, the the distribution, and you manage all of the money. And yeah. so it's a it, you know, it, 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 it was basically just a choice of which way you wanted to go. And uh, we've done both. You and I have both done both. And so it, it you know, and, and I would say I prefer my preference is to work with a McGraw Hill or in this case of my new book that's coming out in September with a Kogan page because they handle all that heavy lifting that I just don't want to do. And I'm way more willing to, you know, to to uh, forego uh, a percentage of sales because for me again it's not about the money it's about the distribution and the the ease by which i can get a book done 
True. Uh, and I think a lot of it's changed with uh, if you've been paying attention at all to where what Amazon's been doing with their algorithms, it's tougher to get hard, uh, raw really discovery hard. from yeah. from Amazon. I mean, just in the past couple of years, yeah. it's been where I've seen with, with content Inc. coming out, the first version of content Inc. I was seeing that you could see that thing. I was fine getting found in discovery all the time. <clears throat> the second version, much more difficult, much more challenging to get found. Yeah. So if you just play the game of, oh, okay, I'm doing this for discovery purposes, much more difficult than it's ever been before. Totally. To get any Agreed. book for, through traditional discovery. So if you're a content creator, content entrepreneur, or you have a, a you have direct contacts with whatever company you're at, you have opt-in readership ready to go, you could just go direct and maybe be better off and make money at the same time. <laughs> Be, it with off of a, a smaller theoretical audience base because they're already tuned in what you have to sell. Yeah, th- so, absolutely. So today it's anyways, I feel bad about it. We have, we, we have a lot of friends there that, that lost their jobs. Yeah. And, uh, and best wishes to them. I, I just, the whole thing is, you know, really, really good people off to do different things. So I wish them the best on what they're doing. I do not disagree with you. I think that if you look at McGraw Hill's back catalog catalog which our books are sitting in there they could wrap that up on a bow and sell that off because yep. that's the great thing about it's a great content. book if you do it well it's evergreen <clears throat> in a lot yeah. of cases and even killing marketing even though it's been six years old now it still sells a couple hundred books every every few weeks that's right uh, and just sort of on and on and on and on so yeah we'll see yeah anyways i didn't want to you know, no, no, it's a great talk about Elon, but it, well, we're, it's it, interesting because I haven't seen a press release or or articles come out about oh, McGraw Hill Education stops their business line. I think yeah, that's a big. That's, I think that's a big news article. So, well, we well we're we're breaking the news here. We're breaking as it. it. Were yeah, as, we're breaking the always. news here breaking and information about Florida, Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> and business books and cocoon eggs. There we go. <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it speaks to the turmoil that's going on in media right now, which we'll obviously get to. But the first story that we'll cover here in level of depth uh, is a, from our friend Elon, of course, which there's a lovely video from him uh, on the front page of the CNN.com, which is what we'll link to in the show notes, of course. Um, and basically... He's speaking exclusively to CNBC after the Tesla annual meeting and basically saying that, well, he disclosed that due to a 50% drop in advertising revenue, shocking absolutely nobody, uh, and a heavy, heavy debt load, again, shocking absolutely no one, uh, the platform has a negative cash flow. Again, shock, <laughs> surprising absolutely no one. It's funny how... It's called math. Um, the billionaire owner tweeted on Saturday that in response to business advice from a follower, need to reach positive cash flow before we have the luxury of anything else. The tweet is in stark contrast to his tone in April when Musk told the BBC that the platform is now roughly breaking even and that most of its advertisers have returned. Ad revenue has been a contentious issue and an uphill battle for the site after hordes of advertisers fled Musk o- took over. Advertisers were concerned about content moderation, mass layoffs, and general uncertainty about Twitter future. Linda Yaccarino, a former NBC Universal marketing executive, recently took over the CEO, and he's likely betting on her advertising experience to bring them back. And the article goes on uh, just for a little bit more to talk about some of the numbers and to talk about some of the how the ad revenue has dropped and whether or not that it would be from threads or from just general malaise around the network. What do you think? What do, what do you, I mean, we, it's not like this was surprising to anybody, but is there... Is there something, is there some insight here, some new insight that we can either see the the writing on the wall for Twitter, or is this just a big bump in the road for, for Elon? Well, I, I don't see the writing on the wall for Twitter at all, because Elon can keep this thing going as long as he wants to keep it going. I yeah, mean, he's, he's got That's right. billions and billions of dollars. He could he could run this at a loss for, for a long, long time. Yeah. So there's no issue there. I think the issue is, is that you have what? What is the number you said? Forty three percent of advertisers that were there in September are Correct. still with the program or whatever. Yep. So I'm assuming that will and I'll and I'll I'll bet you that's the bot is because so, basically the way it said is the forty three percent of Twitter's top one thousand advertisers. So it's four hundred and thirty of the bottom of that oh, yeah. of that spectrum. You know what yeah. I mean? It's so not it's, uh, it's not the top guy, half. Yeah, the my pillow guy still sure. on. You got a yeah. couple other ones. Okay. Um, we talked about this a few episodes ago. 
Twitter, if you look at it in comparison to other social media platforms, it is the worst converting of anything. I mean, mm-hmm. unless you're looking at brand loyalty metrics, uh, it, it doesn't work as well as Facebook. It doesn't work as well as Instagram. It doesn't seem to yeah. work as well as pay-per-click. So if you're looking at it on an option uh, or a, a, a number of options that you have to say, here's where I'm going to put my online advertising, it's way, way down at the bottom. Yep. And you and I both, we were talking about it before the show, how you have companies out there that are being a little bit more discriminatory about what they choose to spend from a marketing standpoint, thinking that, I mean, even though it seems like we're, we came to a soft landing and we this, this recession is not going to be as bad as people think, who knows? We're still sort of trying to figure all that out. But we know that a number of these organizations have stopped spending on things and they're not going to just out of the blue say, oh, no, I feel good about it. I'm going to start spending on Twitter again. And I think it's a bad look. I mean, <laughs> why would – here's my question to you, Robert. If you were an innovative company of any kind or if you cared about what customers <laughs> about you at all – Which is a, a why complete would you hypothetical. On <laughs> why would you <laughs> – why would you advertise yeah. on Twitter at all? Yeah, because there's there's so much negativity. You mu- you you just you don't give a crap about what people think about you if you're on Twitter. Sure. I think right. That's true. Yes, yes. So, well, I'll I'll try not to take that weird backhanded introduction to that co- as a backhanded compliment there. So if I was innovative, yes. If if I was, <laughs> if if in some magical world that I was actually an innovative person, um, look, I think. When we look at Twitter right now, it is it is toxic, right? It is toxic for 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 advertising, and not necessarily because uh, you won't get performance, but because of the the content that your ad is much more likely to appear against, right? So even if you're buying the most <clears throat> inoffensive hashtags or targeting the most inoffensive segment of users you're still going to appear next to just awful content. And that's the, that's the self-inflicted wound that I think is the, is the biggest challenge is because we've long known, and I think the, the sort of fundamental and maybe, you know, suicidal in, in many ways, uh, you know, uh, of decisions that Elon made for this platform is that tension and arguments and conflict win the day on an engagement but it's not reduced down to left versus right or awful toxic arguments about politics or about you know flat earth or about all the different kinds of things that are happening in the name of free speech and so the you know thoughtful or more nuanced or at least more articulate uh, tension and engagement over people having discussions is what is is really the idea there that attracts advertisers. And so it's basically, are you telling a good story? And right now, Twitter, the content is not telling a good story. And so advertisers are going to look at that and go, I don't care what the performance is. I don't care if I'm, you know, one of a few advertisers and therefore will get a much more disproportionate share of reach into that audience. I don't want my ads, I don't want my brand displayed against that level of toxicity in the content. And so I'm not going to spend the money there. And so that's the that's the calculus and and so that's what has to switch. And I just don't think it will. I just don't think well, it, I don't I don't think it's going to switch. I'm not sure I agree with you. I think that Sure. If- Twitter ads performed well, you'd have advertisers on it. But since they don't perform well, why the heck are we going to try it? That's my whole thing. Well, I think it's a relative question, right? I mean, I think performance is always a relative question. In, in other words, I, I, I don't disagree with you that that performance would increase the interest for for advertisers. Uh, and, and so, but that's but it's relative to the risk that I'm taking on a brand side of things because it's just it, it's. You know, we don't want just, I mean, any, look, look, <laughs> never discount the ability for marketers to make bad decisions. But but from my perspective, from my marketer perspective, when I think about this as a, <laughs> as a, as a, maybe an innovative person, um, I, you know, a. It's not on you, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, but when I think about that, I think 
I care about the quality of traffic that I would be generating in my advertising, despite how it would perform. There's a reason that I don't go to these places, publications, media companies, and rent the audience of advertising because I know the audience is toxic, and they're not my. It's not my people, yeah. right? It's not my. It's not who I want coming and 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 ultimately, uh, even if the performance is high, so it, it doesn't. At a certain point, those two those two lines cross. I don't disagree that performance is an important indicator, but it at some point it also crosses a line of brand safety and adjacency to the content, despite the fact that it performs high and it makes and it it's a, dis, a disincentivation to to actually uh, purchase advertising. I was listening to the uh, and we had a lot of drive time, and I was listening to the Smartless podcast. Jason Bateman, Sean Hayes, Will Arnett's great, great podcast. podcast. Yeah, yeah, I. I I love listening to that when they've got, and they got some amazing guests. Simon Pegg was on probably ah, promoting yeah. Mission Impossible. And they were talking about, you know, he's not on any social media at all. And he said, he said, well, I just got back on Instagram. I got on Instagram, but I left Twitter because it just seemed like everyone was drunk and angry and they all sort of just agreed with it. Oh yeah. 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 So, but there's a lot of people that like that. There's a lot of people that want that type. Yeah, of it's combative, it's, back and forth, contest issues that. To your earlier want. point, that may be a viable network, right? I mean, you know, t- Twitter, you know, for the drunk and angry is the tagline, right? Yeah, so uh, that that absolutely is a smaller, uh, but perhaps viable social network for you know. It, 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 it's, you know, I often talk in my workshops about, you know, there's put your drunk uncle in the closet. Twitter may be the drunk uncle that you put into the closet. You know what I mean? It's, it's, but it's, it's, it's think about this. We talked about Twitter is so it's, I mean, you, you mention every time about Jay Bear's comment about it's not how many are on Twitter, but who's on Twitter. Right, right. But Twitter is the smallest company that anyone talks about. It's so, so small. It's like right. if you were talking about technology and you mentioned a small small business out of Cleveland, Ohio that just started doing tech stuff. That's it, right. It's so incredibly small in here. We're spending a large amount of this old marketing time, probably yeah, 20, that's right. 20% yeah. of all the things we talk about are Twitter lately. I don't know what yeah. that says about us. But. Well, I mean, I just was looking at threads, right, which is already, you know, at 100 million users. And this is maybe a nice segue to our next story. Sure. Um, you know, when when threads got to 100 million in five days or whatever, it was now the uh, I looked on I, I went and looked and it's the 35th most popular uh, social social network. 35th okay. that 100 million users is 35th in line. Twitter is somewhere around, you know, 20 or something. Um, and, uh, and I'm maybe getting that number slightly wrong, but it's not, it's not near the top 10, right? So, you know, we're, it's well away from being the, even in the top 10. And it's basically, if you go, oh, okay, name 10, like, like name 10 social media networks. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, 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 well, it, then, it, so, be- yeah. I mean, I mean, you're, so you're talking, you're talking Facebook, you're talking WhatsApp, you're talking Instagram. Sure. Yeah, or up there, exactly. Snap, TikTok. Yeah. So they're way up there and then way down. Sure. At the scrolling down or the next page. That's right. You're going to find Elon's space. That's right. Next you're going to get into the discords. You're going to get into, you know, a, a lot of different social networks before you, uh, you know, before Twitch, you hit. Yeah. You know, yeah, all exactly. All right. All right. So what exactly. about threads? What yeah. Let's talk about, on? yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let's look at what, what's going on with threads here because, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that after a super, Nova, as it were, as a fiery start, uh, as Digital Information World uh, says here, uh, it experienced monstrous success uh, after its initial debut. But the basically, it has um, yeah, maybe maybe come down a little bit. Um, people love the engagement that was coming forward; that that has been well reported by a number. But now, tracking firms are starting to claim that despite the fiery start, says this article. Things are not exactly what many had hoped for, and that's why user engagement is moving in a downward direction, something that no meta executive would wish to hear. By the looks of it, the classic notion related to what goes up must someday come down, and it may be coming down very, very quickly. Uh, the news comes to us thanks to experts at Sensor Tower uh, and some researchers from similar, uh, similar web. 
who claim that user engagement and growth have taken a hit and aren't what was observed at the start. Um, and then they basically provide a little bit of a graph there that shows that, you know, where Instagram is maintaining and increasing a little bit and Twitter is maintaining and maybe even increasing a little bit to compare to their numbers. And when we see this, this is the week of July 5th through July 9th, threads is uh, coming down uh, substantially. Now, uh, obviously, there's the launch of a, of a platform and that heat. And so I think you have to grade a bit on a curve here, but, 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 but what do you think? I mean, is this, you know, New York times did an article about how threads could become the next Google plus, you know, do we, do we think that there's a there there? Is it way too early to tell? I mean, it's what, what too, are we, it's way what are too we early. I, I, I actually hedged on whether or not we should even bring this up because yeah. how this is the, this is this data is from a week ago and mm-hmm. it's right after launch. And of course, you're going to have everyone run and see, oh, what's going on? I want to sign up. The sign up process was so easy. I'm going to check it out. You had a number of people That's right. check it out. I was thinking about this. I'm like, how do you, what's the comparison? Is it okay? You have a new, let's say you have a new roller coaster amusement park that just opened and everyone locally wants to go check it out. So the first couple of days are really, really busy. And then you get a good percentage of those that say, Hey, I'm going to buy a season pass and I want to go all the time. That's right. And the other ones are like, that's not for me. And you're going to continue to see that. And so I think you're going to see this. You saw this big run up and number of new users, and then you're going to sort of normalize down and we'll find out what it is in a couple months. Yeah. I think that's that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely right. I think, um, you know, I mean, what are we in week three or something? Or week three or, or of, of yeah, we're of, going in. It's so, just a baby. It's I, just it, a widow. It's, it's not a even widow social media baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not even uh, a baby. Yeah, it's not it's right. Just right. born. Yeah, it, it's hello, just... <laughs> hello, little Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> welcome oh. to the world oh Sorry. dear I, I oh, apologize dear. to everyone yeah. out there for that. that is that is <laughs> there's the title of your show um the- baby zuckerberg <laughs> takes a turn <laughs> <laughs> oh man that is just not a pretty picture that i want to put in my I, head here. i would i would agree with you that I mean, even myself, I mean, I looked at it and then I'll, I'll check it out every couple of days now, but I'm, I haven't committed to it. I mean, the only app right now that I'm on on a regular basis is LinkedIn. Yeah. I see that as important to my business and what we're doing at the tilt and creator economy expo and everything else. And I'm not investing time in it. And some people are do, still doing amazingly well on Twitter. Yeah. And some people have taken that over and they're doing amazingly well on threads. Well, good for them. Yep. I'm, I'm, you know, we're not taking well, our time. I, I think you've got a lot of lurkers on there just seeing if it's a, and who we're talking about it as a replacement for Twitter. It, it might, there's probably a world where the two can, can do well in their own little fiefdoms, if you will. Yeah. We don't know. I, I think that's true. I, well, I absolutely think that that's true. And, and, and for me, um, I would say it just hasn't entered it. Ha- I haven't gotten it into my workflow yet because mm-hmm. so my workflow for social media is that I spend a good amount of time, not, not the same amount of time every morning, but in the morning is when I typically go to social media and I react or I make posts or, uh, and I do the, you know, I, I sort of comment on other people's things and I read and I get, you know, I get my sort of fix on the news and all those things, LinkedIn primarily, um, Facebook for friends and stuff like that, but LinkedIn um, and historically Twitter and now threads. Now, the thing is for posting, I use, uh, I use, and this is, I'm not getting paid or I don't have any affiliate deal with them or anything, but I use Buffer. Um, and to be honest, I don't love it. I mean, I don't love any of them, by the way, but, but Buffer is the what I use to sort of manage my channels, right, from a content perspective. And I, you know, I go in and I pick a few things and I schedule them to go out and, and all those kinds of things. And then, and then I'm done for the day. I'm done for the day until the evening when I sort of check and see, oh, how's the things going? And I make, maybe make some more comments, et cetera, et cetera. So two yeah. times a day is when I sort of go into that. Well, because Threads doesn't have access yet to any of the publishing tool. I'm not publishing a lot on threads right now. So I'm checking it every morning and I'm reading through and I'm loving the content that I see, but I'm not, I'm not an active participant yet because I just haven't worked it into my workflow just as yet. So sure. I, I think that's the, it, it, my, it, that graph that was in that article is me 
writ large, right? And so I look at that and go, yeah, that's me. I, that's exactly what happened to me. I jumped on it and started engaging. And then I've kind of backed off because I just haven't worked it into my pattern yet. And so that will come with time for sure. I think that's a great point that a lot of people aren't talking about is the fact that it's super easy to get signed up and it's super difficult to integrate into anything you're currently doing. That's as right. As a marketer and a content creator. So you everything is <clears throat> going to take a little bit longer on threads. Yeah, you know, I got to copy and paste it over here. I got to move yeah, it. I can right. just publish it. Yeah. So yeah. I totally And totally there's no desktop that. app and and all that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So So we'll you see. Know. Yeah, we'll see. They'll be yeah. I'm sure they'll be fine. Baby yeah, so Zuckerberg's baby. Gonna be okay. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> Let's cover our last one here, which is uh, uh, an interesting one before we get to our Q&A, um, which is sort of a summation of everything we've been talking about in this particular uh, episode. Um, and it's about the media industry, uh, and it's in turmoil, apparently, uh, so says CNBC. And that's not changing anytime soon. And I think it's interesting because there are a few other outlets that have been reporting on this, and we've certainly seen it anecdotally. Um, but basically, the article, as it starts out, and says, you know, look, traditional TV is dying, ad revenue is soft, streaming isn't profitable. Eh, I'm not sure about that one. Mm. Um, and Hollywood is practically shut down as the actors and writers unions settle in for what is shaping to be a long and bitter work stoppage. All this turmoil uh, will be on investors' minds as the media industry kicks off its earnings season this week with Netflix up first on Wednesday, uh, which will be tomorrow as we record this. Um, but Netflix, with a new advertising model uh, and push to stop password sharing, looks the best position compared with legacy media giants. Last week, for instance, Disney CEO Bob Iger extended his contract through 2026. We talked about it on this show, telling the market that he needed more time at the mouse house to address challenges. Um, we definitely could talk about that. Um, and, um, and as well as some of the other streaming networks and what's going on with Paramount, with um, Warner Brothers and Discovery um, and all those kinds of things. So as an industry overall, from media perspective, what do you think? And does this actually, I'm fascinated with this question, does this provide an opportunity for product and service brands to take advantage of this disruption? What do you think? Uh, I I believe you and I both been around our share of trade shows. Sure. And what happens in a trade show, we've talked about it, is if the number one and the number two players are at a trade show, the number three, the four, the five, and the six players are also there. Like you That's have right. to be there. You feel like, oh, yep. my competition's there. I have to be there. Well, what's happened in the ever when, when we all said, oh, my God, we're going to go into this recession, everybody batting down the hatches, whatever, you had a lot of these players that moved off the platforms. And that gave permission for people to say, oh, we're going to lower, cut back our advertising as well. And so that's what we're seeing right now. Everybody said they totally low, said pull back our advertising, pull back any new uh, marketing expenditures, and we'll see. So everybody's in we'll see, let's see mode. And I really believe we're at that point where, you're going to start seeing either the major players or, to your point, some opportunities there for the four, five, six new startups to say, nobody's there. Nobody's doing this right now. Let's get into this. Let's do the advertisement. Let's uh, let's try Netflix ad option. Yep. Um, let's do something on network that nobody's doing. And then you'll start to see the major players come back. So I really do think we're at the bottom of this dip. And we're going to start coming out of it. I've seen some more interest in the stuff that we're doing at the tilt. Like it was ghost town for six months. I'm like, oh my God, everyone stopped advertising. Now you're starting to, to get word that people are ready to add advertising again. And I think that 24 should be a pretty decent year. I think 23, not good. Not a yeah. great year, yeah. Uh, but you're going to plan for 24. I think people are going to put it back into their budgets, to, and you're going to see 24 be okay. But I think that's what happened. Everybody's like, yeah. "Oh, well, good. Give me per it gives me permission as a CMO or as a VP of marketing to say, oh, nobody else is doing it. I'm not going to get in trouble. I'm not going to yeah. get a fire for pulling this back. They're all they're asking for more budget money anyways. So instead of me firing some people, let's pull back some budget." Yeah, I think you well, I think you're exactly right. And I think what often gets lost in this conversation and and it's because we're just prone to do it as, you know, when we when we look at this is to is to not we shouldn't forget that the entire business model of media has shifted and changed. Um and you know, we watched it happen in the I don't know, early to mid 2000s with the music industry. We saw it, you know, we we saw this 
fundamental change in the way that musical artists get paid. You know, it was no longer radio. It got into streaming. It got into live events, which is now the by far the way that most big artists make their 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 big dough. Um, and by going direct to consumers, by you know going direct to consumers outside the bounds of the the record companies, and so record companies were uh, summarily you know disrupted. Um, had many 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 of them sort of get aggregated in, get you know aggregated out, etc. We saw it happen as we mentioned in the beginning of the uh, to the the, the the what's been going on in the publishing industry for years, even when you know to your. Uh, to 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 your career and how you pivoted in 2008 and 2009 out of the publishing industry and a complete fundamental disruption, tectonic shift in the publishing industry for magazines, newspapers, etc. And now we're seeing it sort of come full circle with film and film studios and television. It's just a different, fundamentally different, and I'll get a little bit into this when I talk about the actor and writer strike, um, but it is it is a fundamentally different business model all the way around, and we're seeing that you know very few people were crying for the rock and roll musicians and the pop stars when this went through. They said basically the the world said change your business model, you know you got to you stop crying about it and evolve. And very few people cried for the record companies. Very few people cried for, you know, B2B publishers. Very few people cried for uh, B2C publishers. Very few people have cried for the newspapers. Very few people have cried for all these different media industries that have been turned on their head with the way that technology has democratized the distribution and the consumption of content. And so this is that. And so there are many, many challenges, many, many opportunities, many, many um, people that will be fundamentally disrupted out of this. But without recognizing that, we start starting to put blame on people, right? And we watched it happen in the music industry. We watched the music industry put the blame on consumers and piracy. And that was all about, you know, oh, people are downloading music and for free and they're they're absolutely wrong and they're stealing and, and all of that. And they fought it and lost. And we saw it in the publishers, you know, where it was like, oh, people are scraping our content and getting, you know, oh, and, and they've fought it and they've lost. And we need to understand the context in which these battles are being fought and which this disruption is happening because it's happening. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. And so the question isn't who's at fault and how do we blame somebody and how do I get mine? It's how do I evolve in this new world? And that's something that I see so rarely covered these days in this media disruption. Um, it's, it's, it's just, you know, you, you look at it and go, you've got to, you got to evolve into it. I'm sorry. I totally blacked out. What wow. Did you say? There you go. <laughs> okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. If I were that innovative, was a, if that I were was innovative, an excellent answer, but you know what you got to, how long have we been saying that though? I mean, I know we've been talking it's, about it's this for like, 10 years. But if, if you look at the CNBCs of the world, the advertising ages of the world, the Publishers Weekly of the world, they they talk about it, but they talk around it. And they That's still, right. It seems like they still believe the same business model from 20 years ago is the one that we're dealing with now. Yes, exactly right. That's ah, yeah. Off my lawn. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's exactly that's that's it. Right. And even to the point of what you see purported and this gets a little bit into my commentary on on the on the actors and writers strike it is it is a it is a nostalgia right it is a desire to go back to the way things were or to look at the way things were and go that's the way they should be and it's instead of thinking of the way the new way that it should be um yeah. and that is what causes so much of the the conflict and it's just it's a harder discussion to have right but when there's when there's when there's not a bad person and a good person in other words when there's not a villain and a hero the story becomes much more complex yeah it it reminds me back to when you and i had the conversation in 2008 and we said oh my god every company on the planet is going to have a media division right we right. just said it like we know it's going to happen and nobody else seems to get that we should do something like, I mean, <laughs> well, you know, here's a funny thing, not to pat ourselves again too much on the back here for this, but I was actually for 
uh, for this class, one of the classes that I'm putting together, I was going back and rereading uh, a, you know, our, our, our original book, right? Managing Content Marketing from 2011. Yeah. And rereading one of the quotes that we said, and it was where we wrote, you know, the whole idea that in the future, companies like IBM and Ford and, you know, all of these sort of blue chip companies would have media companies built within them to handle this disruption of, and, and at that time we were saying the disruption of social media and the disruption of media uh, and we were talking at, in the large part about the, 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 the publishing industry. Yeah. And we were saying they would all build this as a capability to build their own audiences. And that was in 2011. And, and, it, and it's, it's just like, yeah, it, it, it happened. It, it's happening. Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. There you I'm go. Sorry. There, <laughs> it there did. you go. There and you still go. People don't believe it. All still right. People are in denial. Let's uh, let's get to our Q um, and A, right. and let's talk. Let's let's get the because this is a perfect question as we get right, teed up do, here. You want to do Peter's, Peter? Yeah, uh, Peter. Peter's question. question. Yeah. All right. Let me load this up and see if I get this right. Okay. Okay. Um, just starting my new role here as the director of marketing, and um, was thinking about your idea of print, and we are thinking of doing a print magazine and maybe sending it to prospects uh, and then taking them to trade shows. Do you have any recommendations on (laughs) where I might be able to get that done? Because um, yeah, print does seem to be dead, especially when you Google it, it's hard to find someone you can rely on. So uh, thanks guys. A lot of confidence in Peter's voice right there. He's, he's, he's going into this full guns blazing. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you, this is your world. What, 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 yeah. What's your advice for, for Peter? So I think most people know that I, I started in custom publishing. We used to do custom magazines for large B2B organizations. Those are yeah. like quarterly print magazines before we've evolved into social media and, and webinars and other things. So if you don't have expertise in the organization, this is a really – to do a like a quality – consistent print publication. It's really good to outsource this. There's a lot of amazing talent out there. Uh, whether you want to find an individual that becomes your account manager that knows the ins and outs and how to manage editor- editorial, graphic design, production, printing, the whole thing. Um, so there's a couple places to look. Once my old association that I belong to, Custom Content Council, you can go to their member list and you can find companies that this is all they do. So that's one place to look. That's right. The second thing is if depending, Peter, on what industry you're in, you're going to have uh, traditional media companies, publishers, business to business publishers that all have custom publishing arms. Every one of them does this. So whether they're in electronics engineering uh, industry or uh, machine design or travel, doesn't matter. Every company that you will look at that has their own media website will do probably print custom publications for you. That's the difference on whether they do just digital or print. So you want to make sure that they have some understanding of the print publication process because uh, it is much, much different because you want to make sure you find the right printer. You want to understand somebody that knows how to go on site and do a press check, understand the graphic design capabilities are actually quite different and what you need to do to the specifications of a print publication, how many pages, the forms, the whole thing. So I would say, and, and by the way, this is something that you, Peter, you could take in house at some point, but you definitely to start do a one year deal, four issue deal. I would do, you know, start with a quarterly magazine. And I love the goal. I've worked on a number of publications, print magazines, where the goal was to open up the doors for salespeople for prospecting. You'd send it out to a prospect list, or you'd make sure that you get this in the hands of your sales rep so they could go in, position themselves as thought leaders. They open up this magazine and say, oh my God, I didn't know that you know your company understood this issue so well because yep. what's in the magazine is not promotional in nature. It's, it should be very much educational. And you're focused just like any other media product that you would put out there. So that would be my advice. Go out, go to something, find a custom publisher that has done this before, either traditionally uh or in uh, in your market and you'll you'll find them all over the place and peter by the way you know if you, you can reach out to robert or myself we probably have some some recommendations that we can't say over this podcast sure but those are the, for everyone in general those are those are where i would start i don't know if you have anything uh, the only thing i'll add i mean because that's perfect advice it, it, the only thing i'll add is is that it's a good idea right so if you're still trying to convince yourself or your boss that this is a good idea um 
there are many companies out there that are doing this just remarkably well. And in fact, CDW, you know, the big uh, technology uh, distributor um, and uh, e-commerce provider, um, they they do four print magazines, yep. and they're doing it exactly like what you're trying to do, which is put it into the hands of their salespeople as a calling card, as a way of getting their bigger clients to uh, engage. And they do it by vertical, right? They, so they're doing. They have an education one that only goes out to education professionals. They go out. They have one for government. They have one for um, manufacturing, I think. Um, and so they do it. And basically, what they've done is they've created a template in their print magazine. And so each one just gets content poured into that template once a quarter and that magazine goes out and it's basically a short run that is that is meant for a sales enablement program and it's been inordinately uh, successful for them. And we've talked about it. I think I mentioned it as, as my, my rave a few weeks ago. There's nobody doing this right now. Yeah. And we've sort of forgotten that Every, you know, most people get the mail six days a week and they're That's getting right. nothing but junk. And it is much easier to break through all the clutter and print these days than it's ever been before, especially if you're going to la launch a podcast today, launch a newsletter today, launch a blog today, a webinar series. Very difficult to get attention. Yeah. Getting attention in the post. Not that difficult. Yep. Something half halfway decent going through print will get somebody's attention. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Great question, Peter, and and fits really well into the the theme of uh, this week's show. Now, do we want to do uh, Linda's question really quick? I think or? we're gonna I, Linda. I think we're gonna wait until next week because I okay. know we're running a little bit. Long. Yeah. We, so we yep. we actually yeah. just so everybody's listening. We we thought we were gonna run really short this episode. Yeah, but we always do this. He's, yeah, we he's always like, oh, this will be like a thirty-five minute show. It never yeah. is. It never is. It never is. Because why? Because we're blowhards. That's, that's really, right. that's, we that's really. We love to we, listen to our own voices. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, then let's get to our rants and raves. Before we get to our rants and raves, do remember to check us out at thisoldmarketing.com um, where you can leave us a voicemail as Peter did. Um, wonderful. Uh, we love hearing your voice um, and being able to put your question on the air. Um, and we've got also, of course, got subscriptions available to Joe's Tilt newsletter and my Experience Advisors newsletter um, where you can get weekly updates and fun content uh, in your inbox that talk about all the things that we're talking about here. And just generally, you can see all the other shows. You can you can view all the other shows. And also remember to go subscribe to our YouTube. Won't you? We've got our own YouTube channel now. It's wonderful. Um, you guys have been asking for it, and we gave it to you, right? So it's And there. thank it's you for the, the – we've yeah. had more comments on this last show than we've ever had before. Oh, so that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. We've been – We've been, I've been trying to reply to those. So thank you so much. And yeah. uh, we're building our own little YouTube community of 17 people. Yeah. Very fantastic. excited about this. All right. So let me go first because mine okay. tees yours up, right? My, okay. my, 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 my little commentary. So yes, um, if, unless you've been under a rock for the last couple of weeks, you know that the actors and writers are, are both on strike right now here in uh, my hometown of Hollywood, California. Um, and that of course affects every actor, uh, and writer that is part of the union, both SAG, uh, SAG-AFTRA, uh, to be clear. And there's a whole complicated thing about which AFTRA uh, workers are actually under a different contract. So people like news reporters and stuff like that, they're all under a different contract. I won't go into that there, but basically all actors for movies and TV shows on strike and all WGA members um, uh, on strike. So those are primarily, again, TV and uh, uh, movie writers. And so... What is it all about? Well, again, if you just read any of the newspapers, they're all talking about this idea that uh, there are sort of two big issues, um, which is one, uh, increase in pay, uh, which is primarily associated with an increase in residuals pay. And we'll get into that in just a moment. And the second is the introduction of AI as a technology and the limits they want to put on it. Now, there are some other issues there as well, but those seem to be the two big issues for, for that actors are, are, are having with, uh, re with regard to this. The first one, the, with regard to money, which is typically what uh, these strikes are all about, is how do we get paid more, is interesting because it's complex. So if you read the newspaper reports and you read a lot of what's going on on social media right now, Look, the 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 production, you know, the studios, the AMPT uh, is basically not doing themselves any favors uh, with this, the narrative that they're creating out there by looking at themselves as sort of the big 
Bond villain level uh, sort of um, uh, conglomerates and et cetera. And the actors are, of course, doing a fantastic job of telling their narrative as the woefully put upon, uh, you know, <laughs> sort of serfs in the in, in the kingdom being, um, you know, uh, stomped on by the king. So it's a little more complicated than that is my only point here, which is when we look at the issues and we start peeling back the ideas what it comes down to is really an increase in pay, which, of course, probably is not the sticking point. Again, I'm not part of the negotiation, so I don't know. The producers have said that they've offered a big increase in pay to actors, the largest ever in history. The actors have said no uh, to that. My suspicion is, is that it's not the increase in pay that's a sticking issue. They probably have agreed to that. It's the residuals part of that. And so just very quickly, the way residuals work or have worked for years and years is that if you're in a movie um, or you're in a TV show, you the pay that you get, what you negotiate for when your agent works for you and does all the things, is you get paid for showing up on the set, doing the work, and the first run of whatever that particular show or movie is. It's a little more complicated than that, but just for the sense of uh, simplicity, think of it like that. Then residuals, basically, are what you get paid based on that initial amount you got paid lesser than for each subsequent run of that. So if you think about the classic TV show, you get hired as an actor, you get paid for showing up on set and the initial the series of first run of that particular show across a season and then you get residuals for every time that it's basically played thereafter and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as time goes on. And so the, the key with television was syndication, right? In the cable TV area, it was, uh, or the broadcast TV area, era, it was all about, ah, if you can make it to syndication, you're, you're going to be good to go forever because basically at that point you get rerun every year. No, other networks pick you up. They run the whole series. You get paid over and over and over again. And so in the movie business, you get paid for DVDs, you get paid for the television run, you get paid for the airlines, you get paid for all those sort of roles as well. Now, in the streaming area era, as we just talked about on the show, it's fundamentally put on its head because no longer can you measure success by things like syndication. It just doesn't exist anymore. Because if I make Stranger Things or if I make a series, it gets bought by Netflix and it stays on Netflix for a foreseeable future. And there's no way to say, well, it's going to run for three years of a season. No, it doesn't work that way. It's all on demand. I might watch one episode or I might binge watch the whole thing. And so basically the way residuals work now is, and this was happened a few years ago, their contract gets renegotiated every few years, is that actors uh, get paid basically based on the popularity of the network and they get paid a one-time residual based on the fact that they've now they're rerunning this show. Now you can argue that that's not fair. I argue that it's not fair. They should things should change. But the question is, what should they change into? This is the thing. And so you, what the actors seem to want here, as as far as I can read. Uh, is that they want a third-party measurement to go in and measure popularity. Because right now, it's not about popularity. You get a hit show on Paramount, you're getting less money than you have on a sort of mediocre show on Netflix because Netflix has such a huge uh, user base. And so what's happening is, is these hit shows are happening on small networks like Hulu or Peacock or those kinds of things. And the studio is making good money by creating that show but the actors aren't getting the paid based on the popularity. They're getting paid based on the, the, the popularity of the network. So there's some weird sort of incentivizing going on in terms of the way that money is flowing here. But interestingly, the pay, the residuals, if you look at WGA data, have never been higher. In other words, what has happened is, is because so much content got made that all of these people really – the entire audience of people got paid more, but basically per actor or per writer, the number is much smaller because more people are getting paid a little bit rather than a few people getting paid a lot. All I want to say is, is that this is likely to go on for a while. The streaming networks really don't have a lot of incentive to actually change this because they can, they can sit this out for a while and the studios, quite honestly, are going to be looking at this a little with a little more urgency because they will run out of content faster than the streaming networks because 
nobody's going to cancel their Netflix sub- subscription because there's not a new you know hit show coming up. And so they can wait this out a lot longer. So the actors, I think, are in a really bit of a tricky situation here because they might get what they want. But what they're going to be doing then is forcing the economy to basically go, okay, we're going to shrink down the number of writers, the number of actors that are actually getting paid to give them more money. And I think that's an interesting and challenging and very complex part of this negotiation because they may win, but they may actually undemocratize the ability for streamers to pay lots and lots of people in the process. And so that's my only point. Well, that's a great insight into that. I think only you could give insight like that because you live in Hollywood. So you firsthand are hearing this insider knowledge. <laughs> it's not insider. It's just somebody who's... <laughs> it's, out, it's, it's just it, on the periphery. It's just a marketing <laughs> dude looking at it and saying, what's who's, what, the, what the heck's going on here? And trying to look ah, at man. this from both sides. Seeking first to understand before I be understood. So yeah. Yeah. It's, there's, a, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Uh, I loved your comment. Now, this was totally separate, but you, I was, we were having an email conversation mm. and I was sort of watching and you were talking about how uh, Bob Iger from Disney is thrilled right now. Oh my God. He's loving this, right? Because of the writers and the actors strike that he doesn't have to make more expenditures. He's excused, right? And by the He's way, excused. so are his competitors, right? To your point about the whole, you know, everybody's, you know, if one shows up to a trade show, another shows up to, he doesn't have to show up to the trade show because nobody's at the trade nobody's show. Nobody's at the trade <laughs> so, show. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's a lot of forgiveness in that area. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. So mine, I'm, I'm super quick. I'm just going to tell people that they should do this. I listened to uh, the last episode, so it'd probably be two from now, but it was uh, Mogadet. Uh, who is the former chief business officer at Google X was a guest on the Prof G Professor Scott Galloway podcast. Um, So there's a, it's like an hour and a half long. Uh, The first 20 minutes of that episode is Scott going on a rant about threads and Mark Zuckerberg. You can or can, you don't have to listen to that. Go to the interview and listen to the interview. I've listened to it twice. I probably will listen to it a third time. I've never heard somebody so eloquently talk about what they believe is going to happen with artificial intelligence in the very near future and in the next five years. Um, This guy is super smart and he just talks in a language that I think everyone will understand. I, I don't even know. I I mean, right now I'm getting sort of emotional about it because I don't know what to do as a content creator, as an author with what Mo was talking about that, that he believes what will happen in the near future. First of all, in the first quarter of next year, he believes there's going to be some, what he calls a patient zero event where the truth, nobody will know the truth because of AI, whether that's a deep fake, whether that has involved with the 2024 election, he, he doesn't know, but he believes that will be the first sign that things are happening. Where it really hit hard for me is he said, Hey, look at the first edition of chat GPT that came out. According to measurements, they said that, uh, chat GPT, the first version had an IQ of 155. I think Einstein had 160 IQ. So basically they birthed an Einstein out of this. The next version, which is already out is 10 times smarter than that version. The next version, which will be out in eight months, which is already exists. They just haven't released it yet or whatever is going to be 10 times smarter than that version. And he said, You'll be able to, and basically he was almost talking to Scott. He said, Scott, I know that you're an author. You're really, really smart. But in the next couple of years, I can go to ChatGPT or some other AI and create a book that's a thousand times better and smarter than the book that you've created. You can't, you can't compete. You cannot compete because he says, we should have stopped this. He said in 2012, we should have stopped this. We never did. It was never regulated. It's just out in the wild. And you have AI building on AI and building faster. And he was saying, there's not going to be any human coders in the next four years. It's like if you're a computer engineer and you program for a living, it's like a human coder can't move, can't do what an AI coder can. So you have AI coding AI right now. He said that should have never happened, but it's happening. He says, I've seen it in labs. It's happening. And so not to get into like a really scary portrayal or a Terminator version of what's going to happen. But he he goes specifically into content creation. He talks about books, about authors, about content creators, about what AI is going to do in the next six months, 12 months, two years. 
And I think just listening to this, and you don't have to take it all as fact, and I don't know if I believe it all either. I'm, I'm just taking it in as a data point and saying something around this is true. And I think as content creators and marketers, we need to prepare for this. And he basically said, he challenged Scott and said, this might be the end of the knowledge worker. He might be, it might be the end of what Peter Drucker said. You know, we moved, we had this competitive advantage as human beings of strength, how strong you were, how you could move things. You were, you were the top of the food chain. And then that moved from raw strength to our brains, to knowledge. And those people that were smarter and could articulate that intelligence were the ones that got the best jobs, that became lawyers, that became authors, that became doing. He said, well, now you have another entity that can do all those things a thousand times better than you. You can't compete with anything else out there. So what do you do as an individual? He actually, this was funny, Robert. He said that right now in the next four years, if you're a public speaker, if you're really good at one-on-one communication, if you commun- communicate with small groups, you have a huge advantage. Because right now, now, that might happen in the future, but right now that can't be duplicated. Yeah. So interpersonal relationships is what he was saying. Is The humanity, if you will, is going to be a big uh, competitive advantage. So I, I don't know. I know you haven't listened to it yet. I don't know what to make of it. I would just recommend we'll put it in the show notes if you can sure. find it through Google. But yeah, it's a, it well, really it's a, made an yeah. impression on me. I'll tell you that. And I, it's, it's just interesting to see where we go from here. Yeah, it's going to it's a it's. Yeah, I'm going to have to listen to it just to get a sort of full context of what you're talking about here. But, um, you know, it's it's funny because five years ago, yeah, five years ago, I started a book project. It's still, it's like I'm looking at the little icon on my screen right now. Um, I started a book project called The Wisdom Worker. Um, and basically how the evolution of, you know, and the democratization of knowledge was basically making Drucker's uh, uh, knowledge worker extinct. Um, this is way before AI um, yeah. sort of made its its head. And so uh, maybe it's time to to revisit that a little bit and find out how how we as humans evolve um, our working relationship. Well, as an author, too, you're working on a book. I just released a book. I'm thinking about doing, you know, if I do a novel or whatever, I'm thinking, yeah. OK, how do you and we, we talked about this. You can do so through brand, through your communications. It's really important to get your subscribers going. You can differentiate yourself. Yeah. But I know that I can't compete from an intelligence standpoint or from a wit standpoint with something that can be created by a computer. Sure. That is, yep. That, and it's only going to get worse. And it, so what do you do? What do you do when everyone that you know can create a book? Yeah. Well, you can only rely on your experience and that's where, you know, that's where wisdom comes in, right? Wisdom comes in because it's the, it's the ability to synthesize your experience with what the, you know, the reality of the world is. And that's something that, Theoretically, and again, I don't know enough about AI to know if this is possible, but but theoretically, AI doesn't have an experience to draw from, right? They're they're always creating something from the moment. And and the moment that they have may be old because their learning model is a couple of years old or a one year old or six years old or however long it it's been around. So that's the only moment that they know. They can't, you know, they they can't know the context and the precise moment given the, you know, the, the, the ability to be able to draw on that years of experience and combine those two things. And that's really what wisdom is all about. But what? Yeah, I know. When, I know. I know. It's a, that, yeah. When, well, there's that. a giant well, monster you know, movie was, for you. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. We're already too long, so it doesn't matter. But the, 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 the real conversation was the, they're just, AI is just learning from data sets. Sure. Those data sets are true or not true or failed or whatever. But what happens when AI starts learning from AI and creating original things, which it's not doing right now? It's basically just culmin- you know, creating sure. things yeah, from stuff that yeah. already exists. That's a short-term thing that will not be true in the next couple of years. I don't know when the time period will be. Yeah. That, eh, that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about a new career path. <laughs> there you have it. There you have it. There you go. Um, all that right. High note. On that high note, wait, so you've got your big trip. You got you got this yeah, coming we're up. We're still here. on the trip, so we yeah. got, we're going to go see Ryan Reynolds. I'm going to you know I'm going to see if I can get close to him, to touch him, uh, it, touch it, that it, cocoon it, egg, touch yeah. the cocoon effect, yeah, and touch him, and then you know we'll be back and and but so that'll end our week trip around the North Carolina tri-state Fantastic. area, if you will. Yeah, 
and uh, and doing that back into Cleveland. What do you got going on? Uh, this week I got, um, we're just staying out of the heat and I'm heads down working on classes, um, getting ready for content marketing world. I, I can't believe oh that that's, God, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. coming up soon. So doing some getting preparation for that and also just working on, uh, working on these new classes and, and also finishing up, uh, you know, funny enough, my book um, and uh, uh, sort of, you know, the final proofs, final blurbs, Final, all that stuff is going out, so it's getting ready to get start getting printing you presses going. You should call going. it something like the last content marketing book. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> Written oh, by Jesus. a human being. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for your attention. This is the human part of our show. Um, and thank you for sticking around for, uh, for a little bit over time today. Um, and we will see you next week. Um, absolutely. And until we see you next week, just remember it's your story to tell. Tell it well. We'll see you next week on This Old Marketing. 